marvellous to see that old film again. I'm sure Roy Plumley has entertained some of those stars, and indeed the writer, Noel Coward, on his programme. We'll find out after this. I don't have enough. I'll put something back. We'll put back this and this and take bowl three instead. Automatic powder plus fabric conditioner? Yes, it's great value. I don't want to save money if it doesn't work. Bowl three does work. Beautiful. You don't have to spend money on separate powder and fabric conditioner. Bowl three does it all in one. Bowl three really does work. Look at these shorts. Marvellously clean. And my towels are soft and... Mm, so fresh. I won't be buying separate powder and conditioner again when Bold 3 does it all in one. When it looks like the rain will last all day But you have to get the washing dry Just dry electric with a tumble dryer And all the family's washing will soon be gently dry Bouncy and soft, it'll brighten your day So who cares if it rains anyway You'd never soak your face in dirty dishwater, nor rub in household cleaner, or even dab on scara. Yet you do it to your hands every day. But rub in a Trixo, and your hands will be protected, even in water, and still be soft when the work's done. So care for your hands as much as your face with a Trixo. Keep it on hand all through the day. Chili con carne, ready in a can, new from Time Brand, heat in a pan. Great for the family, served with rice, or potatoes, burgers, toast. Nice, deliciously tasty, nourishing too. New chili con carne from Time Brand. No lumps of fat or gristle, guaranteed. Remember marmalade made at home like this? Nothing tasted quite like it. And you can make it just as good today with Seville oranges, specially prepared by Marmaid. Just add sugar and in 30 minutes make a delicious six pounds from one can. Marmaid. You make it yourself, so it must be good. Aim for the facts. Even margarines low in cholesterol are high in fat. St. Ivel Gold has half the fat of any margarine. Aim low. And if you've just joined us, let me introduce my guest again. Well, this is rather an unusual role for him because he's known mostly for the hundreds of people he's entertained on his mythical desert island, Roy Plumley. Talking about Blythe Spirit earlier, Roy, have you um, interviewed or entertained Margaret Rutherford? And oh, yes, Margaret Rutherford and Constance Cummings. And uh, Rex Harrison was in it, yes. of course. And I can't remember. And, of course... Sir Noel himself. Sir Noel. He was marvellous. He was and very witty, I could imagine. Oh, yes. I remember the first time I met him was at a theatrical garden party, and people were coming up to ask for autographs. And one lady came up, a rather elderly lady, and pushed an autograph book at him, and he signed it with a flourish and said, There, madam, for your resentful grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. There's always one that you've never heard of before, isn't there? Always, yes. <clears throat> and Margaret Rutherford, was she wonderful? Oh, delightful, what yes. A sad poetry was her great thing. Really? Uh, what, and did she choose... Sort she of... chose a lot of poetry. Oh, how lovely. Getting back to you, Roy, you started... Are you from a theatrical background? No, for about 200 years <clears throat> or more, my family were medical, of, of one form of medicine or another. Mm. They were physicians or surgeons or... My father was a pharmacist. Oh, I see. So how did you get into this business? Did you go straight well, I away? I don't know. I became stage-struck when I was about 12. I used to go to the local library and read the stage every week. And I knew everything oh, was that was going on, but I didn't know how to get in. But you did get in, didn't I you? I did get in, yes. As I had a film to, actor? As a film actor. I had to start doing all sorts of odd, boring jobs. I was an estate agent for a bit. Then I was in advertising, which I quite enjoyed, mm -hmm. as, as a copywriter. And uh, then I was a mail order astrologer, which is extraordinary. And eventually, I, th I thought, I'll go in at the lowest level. I became a crowd artist. 
which I enjoyed enormously. I loved messing about in the studio. And were these known films with, with famous people? Oh, yes, I remember. Oh, I was there in... you are there. Oh, what was that in? Oh, that was a film at <coughs> Warner Brothers, and there's a, a German singer called Hans Sonke singing, and I'm down in the bottom right-hand corner listening to him. With I can't remember what the film moustache. was called. Dapper Moustache, <coughs> yes. Uh, touch of the Ronald Coleman. That's right. And then after that, you went to... Oh, uh, then after that, I used to go to auditions all the time, I mean, and uh, I went to an audition one morning, and that turned out to be for radio announcers. And I got that job, and that took me to France. Really? a small town on the north coast um, called Fécamp. When would this be? Well, this was in the years before the war, when there were a lot of commercial stations operating in France, because mm -hmm. there was no commercial radio in this country, and they were putting out English commercial stations to Britain. How An extraordinary statistic. 82% on Sundays, 82% of British radio sets were tuned into the continent to Radio Normandy, Radio Luxembourg, Radio Toulouse, Radio Lyons, Radio Côte d'Azur. There were about a dozen of them. Really? How extraordinary. For, and you must have been very young there to... to oh, I was, you know, very young. Very young, this but... This was before the war? This was before the war. Yes. But I was enjoying it enormously. Yes. And then after that... Oh, look, there you are, there. Is that you in the middle? Oh, that's me. That's when I was at Radio Normandy. Um, that's in, mm. in England at a music hall. I think it was the... Empire, the Hippodrome Eastbourne, when you had a road show on the air called Radio Normandy Calling, mm. and I was comparing a broadcast from it. That takes us back. Yes, mm. it was before the war. The whole thing packed up as soon as the war started. Mm. And then after that, how did you get to Desert Island Discs? Well, I was chased out of France in 1940. This was during the war? This was during the war. Mm -hmm. It was a bit hairy, but I got out. It took seven days. And I got back here, and I began freelancing for ENSA and mm. working for the BBC and doing various jobs. And I was selling ideas to the BBC, ideas for radio shows, on the basis of I'd give them one idea and they'd give me one show. Um. And my ambition was to have a series of six. And one night I, I was going to bed, I was living in Diggs, and it was a cold November night. 1941, we are dealing with a lot of old dates, aren't we? And is that how long it's been? Um, well, it began in 1942. I sent them this idea. I thought it was good for six programmes, and to my delight, they booked it for eight. So it's totally your idea? Oh, yes. And you practically man the whole thing yourself. You don't have a research or anything? No, I do all the research myself. I think that's important. I've got to ask the questions to which I want to know the answers. Really? So how many people have you had it's, on your... Um, well, give or take. It's 1,760-something, as many as that. Really? And how many records would that be? That'll be getting on for 15,000 records. I'm slowly getting musically educated. And you must, the joy must be the exciting people that you meet. Well, it's, it's a great privilege, you know. <coughs> Every week I, I meet an exciting person, and I can't alter that whole ridiculous number, 1,700 and whatever it is. I could only remember about six that I didn't enjoy. And that may have been my fault. I, I may have trodden on somebody's foot as we went into the studio. Well, or didn't enjoy it because you just couldn't... We just didn't get didn't together. Have a didn't have any rapport. I don't know. It may have been entirely my fault, as I say. Sure but one wasn't. thing it does prove is that the people who get to the top are, are, are nice people. Yes, l indeed. Like Not only interesting, but fascinating and mm -hmm. warm and friendly. And Sir Ralph Richardson. Oh, Sir Ralph Richardson. Everybody does that when they talk about Sir Yes, Ralph so he, he, he oh, was, was such fun. So gloriously, gently eccentric. He used to cruise around London either on a motorbike or in an open Bentley. And I remember one day he turned up at the Savile Club. He was going in for lunch. Mm. And he climbed out of the Bentley. And then he tapped it on the bonnet and said, no, you'll stay there. And then he went into lunch. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and did he choose good music? He's not very musical, no. He wasn't very musical. He told me that um, in his young days he only had one record, which was two tunes from No, 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 Net. But then he was in a play at the Old Vic with John Gielgud, mm -hmm. and there was a piece of curtain music or interlude that he rather liked, and he said, John, what, what is that? And uh, Sir John said, but you must know that, Riff. I mean, it's a very, very famous piece of music. Very famous. I've never heard of it. So, as a result, John Gielgud sent him some records. And oh. he began to love the, the noise that music made. And he so began... Quite late in life to it. 
I th no, I think that this was possibly in his 30s oh, that the I conversion see. came. But after that, he began to love music, particularly piano music. Mm. I was talking to Dandy Nichols about him. She oh, was a yes. great friend of his. Indeed. And she said, w when he died, because she was very sad, and she said, do you know, I think he just had enough. I think he just, that was it. He just wanted to end it all. Mm -hmm. mm. But he kept working right up right to the end. Right to the very end. Such a darling man. And who else have been your favorites on your program? Oh, Yona, I don't you know. Don't? I, I can't pick them out. There have been so many. Yes. If you were on a desert island, would you be good on a desert island? I'd be yeah. terrible. Terrible. I'm absolutely hopeless. I, I, I can just about open a can of beans and that's it. Now, I'm a menace in the house. I can't knock nails in or screws. Um, yeah, you make other people... <laughs> but, if, <laughs> but if you went, what would... I'm fascinated now. I've really got you in your... Now, what luxury would you take, Mr. What Plumley? luxury would I take? Well, I would take... I would take a desk with a typewriter on top and a lot of paper because, well, I'm a, I'm a writer by trade as well, mm. and uh, it would be business as usual. I'm a compulsive worker. I've got to write every day. Yes. And I think so. And your records, you know what records um, you would take? They vary. I've got one constant. There's an old French record, a very old French record that I came across. It dates back to 1928, and it's an excerpt from an operetta by Oscar Strauss, called Mariette, mm. and there is a scene from it played by Sasha Guitry and Yvonne Printemps oh. that is enchanting. Oh. It's so beautifully played, Thank it's so you. wonderfully timed, mm. that if I had to choose just one record in the world, that would be it. Would you take any pop records, like Paul McCartney? Um, <coughs> Paul, I like the Beatles, yes, indeed, I like the Beatles. I like pop, I like jazz, particularly 30s jazz and, mm. and the old jazz. Because you have interviewed, you have entertained uh, Paul McCartney on your yes, island, I have. haven't you? Yes, that was for our anniversary. <coughs> we happened Excuse to be me. 40 years old. Oh, there he so, is. <laughs> there he is. Yes, we're together. He, I mean, I think his music will become one of the great standards in time to come. Well, I think, you think it already so? is. I mean, tunes like Yesterday. Oh, and, uh, absolutely beautiful. And is it true that an opera singer on your program chose all her own records? Well... <sighs> I don't think it would be fair to mention Madame Schwarzkopf by name, but <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is a lie. You know, she did not choose all her own records. She I only chose she seven oh, out seven. of eight. The eighth was the prelude, orchestral prelude to a new recording she had just, just finished. <laughs> but how did she explain this away? <laughs> she didn't. I mean, she just <clears throat> chose them the way one does. I, admittedly, in the middle of it, she looked at me with a, a grin and said, I am being outrageous. <laughs> and that was the only explanation. <laughs> that was the only explanation. And it was a very successful program. And it certainly served its progress because when if anybody talks about to me about Desert Island Dis, they all say, Now what about Madame Schwarzkopf? Well, I remember it and, and certainly, I mean she did well for herself. Do you know what I think is extraordinary? That it's forty years it's been going, it hasn't dated at all. It's still one of the top radio programs accepted by everybody. Well, people don't date, and every week there are new and exciting people coming mm. up. And it's a great joy. It's my privilege to meet them. It's certainly a privilege to meet you. It really oh, is. Thank, thank you. you. But we will be talking with Roy a little bit later on in this afternoon. Be before that, let's go over to Chrissy Pollard and see what we've got on the TVS News. Thank you, Una. Good afternoon. P&O's new luxury cruise liner has arrived in Southampton prior to being officially named by the Princess of Wales. A round-the-clock security guard will be kept on the £105 million ship while she remains berthed in the port. One of her major selling points is that every cabin faces out to sea and the average cost of a luxury booking £250 a day. A man accused of drug smuggling was released on bail by South End magistrates today with sureties of more than a quarter of a million pounds. 41-year-old Geoffrey King, a builder from Harlow in Essex, is charged with seven others of illegally importing over four tonnes of cannabis worth £10 million. He was bailed until November the 26th. The others were remanded in custody. Repair and restoration work on Winchester Cathedral will cost £350,000 every year for the next five years. According to the cathedral's architect, half a million pounds needs to be spent on the tower alone. A trust has been set up to try and raise the money.
the weather, the rest of the day will be dry and cold. Rain spreading in from the south to all parts tonight. Lowest temperatures overnight, 6 degrees centigrade. And finally, if you want the best possible food, then join the armed forces. According to the 1985 Egon Roney Good Food Guide, the Army Catering Corps at St. Omer Barracks in Aldershot produces food of an exceptionally high quality. Another culinary delight is a hamburger made on HMS Illustrious. And HMS Nelson in Portsmouth produces, says the guide, haddock, which is zingy and super fresh. They should try the TVS canteen. Back to you now. Thank you, Chrissy Pollard. And now it's time for Take the High Road. And in today's episode, nothing goes right for Isabel and Jimmy, and the hill race is going ahead. We'll see you later. <laughs>